So a lot of this stuff I've, I've kind of gone over before in previous years when I've given talks. So uh, if you saw any of those, I'm sorry about that. Or if you remember them, I'm sorry about that. But today I'm just gonna talk specifically about the main stem watershed. Uh, basically all the watershed the French Broad River um, has drained into it. Um, in this area we have, we've documented at least 76 species uh, that we consider native in that whole watershed, uh, fish species. Um, we have 26 additional non-native species, uh, plus or minus, depending. Uh, and then, as of right now, so it's probably hard for most of y'all to see, but these three dots are the main stem dams, MSD, and then uh, the Capitola and Redmond. And when you get above all these dams, uh, there's of those 76, there's at least 35 of them that do not occur in the upper part of the watershed. And that could be for several reasons. Could be maybe they were never there. Maybe there's species that are down here that are were only ever down there. Um, maybe uh, they, we have a record of them in the upper part of the French Broad and they're no longer there, that kind of thing. So there's at least 35 and depending how conservative of an estimate you're talking, it could be anywhere from 10 to, you know, more than 35 that were supposed to be up there. And some of, some of these that make it up, make up that 35 are, there's seven different sucker species that are missing from the upper French Broad, at least five darter species um, Gizzard Chad used to be in the Upper French Broad. They're not there anymore, at least uh, based on our data and my experience. Walleye and Sauger used to be up there. Freshwater Drum, Paddlefish, long nose Gar. These are all, most of these either, well, other than Gizzard Chad, basically everything at the, uh, the bottom half, is, those are all fisheries basically anywhere else. So we're missing fisheries, not just uh, some of these small species. So when you look at the sucker species, these are all the sucker species that are found in the main stem French broad. There's uh, five or six red horse. There's uh, you know white suckers, which are everywhere, hog suckers, which are everywhere. And then um, these four at the bottom, which are carp suckers and buffalo. They're only found in Madison County. And um, when you look at the upper French broad above the dams, That's all that's left. And those four species, what's interesting about those four species, they're all species that can do fine reproducing in small tributaries. They're, they, they can live in a small tributary. They never needed to just be in the main stem French broad, but everything else needs a big river. So if you're stuck in the most polluted place in the watershed and you can't go anywhere else, you can't reproduce anywhere else, you're, you're toast. So that's kind of the, the theory why these things aren't there. But there's a lot of other things that contribute to it. Um, it's hard to read, but these dams were built in 1904, 1910, and 1911. Uh, if you go back and look at just some of the things that were dumping into the river at the top of the watershed, you have like the Rosman Tannery. That was, a, from what I could find, it was basically around 1900, 1901 is when uh, it, we know it was at least running by. It may have been going earlier than that. And so basically all these tanneries, they're, all their waste is basically all going in the river and you can have some real nasty stuff. If any of y'all have ever tanned hides, you probably understand how, how, how nasty that stuff can be. What did you say? The tannery opened in 1895. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Because I, I, I was trying to look for it and I, I knew it was at least then because I found an old newspaper article about it, so thank you. So, and there's some other uh, big things that contributed to uh, loss of species. Uh, outside of dams, you know, the Acousta paper mill we know was rough on the river. This is actually a photo that you, I can send this out later uh, so you all can see on your own screen, but there's a picture of them uh, moving the river uh, when they're building the, the plant. So the lower end of the Davidson's uh, quite a bit different than it used to be. Uh, around 1900, this is the Little River. It, you know, there's not a tree in sight uh, along uh, the tributaries and, and the river. You know, logging, we all know is bad. Uh, 
I don't know how much you all know about splash dams. The splash dams are basically a concept where you had too small of a river or stream to float logs. We didn't have very many roads. We didn't have very many train, train tracks. So we basically, uh, we dumped these logs in a river or a small stream. You would put a temporary dam up, they'd float, you'd blow it up and they'd move downstream and you'd just do that. And that's how they transported these logs. And here's an example of one that they're building um, somewhere. They just said Western North Carolina in the photo, but there's a lot of different uh, types of these splash dams, but they're devastating the tributaries. Um, and just moral of the story is that we have at least 140 years of documented like destruction on our waterways. This is one of my like favorite things I found to really give us, you know, a lot of people think like things are worse now than they've, they've ever been or things were just, they've been really bad like recently in the last 50 years. Uh, this article from 1885, um, a gentleman talks about how nine-tenths of the streams in Western North Carolina are without a trout or minnow. It's in 1885. So there's no life in like most of those. So really of the, the one-tenth that they're probably talking about are, you know, really extreme headwater streams. There's maybe too steep to log efficiently or that kind of thing. But the point is, it's been over 100 years that we've been wrecking shop. There is a report done by um, by uh, Water Resources, uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resources, and uh, or uh, the like DQ, the old old day DQ. In 1966, there they talked about uh, a TVA authority report that said the most polluted place in the South was between the Davidson and Mud Creek, and that's like the heart of the French Broad. So just give more perspective on how wrecked things were. And so all these things together, obviously um, they help contribute to uh, a loss of uh, our overall habitat for fish, especially habitats uh, that were related to floodplain connection and um, backwater oxbow habitat. And that's why it's so beneficial that we're starting to work on introducing these sloughs all over the place and hopefully we can just keep on doing more and more of them because that's really the biggest type of habitat and biggest type of long-term problem that the upper french broad has in my opinion so is the french broad supposed to have oxbows yeah so any anywhere you're you're uh where you're looking there's a big wide flat floodplain. the natural processes of the river would be for it to meander and the evolution of any river that's meandering it's going to have parts bends that are cut off and and still stay intact um, we just had a limited area that we could we we could do agriculture and and other and develop and so we over time filled these things in um, our land use our bad sedimentation built in these areas that's we don't have that's why we don't really have very many uh, wetlands anymore and um, same with these kind of backwater habitats but basically anywhere you get like, so you can see in this photo, we all know where Mud Creek is. It's a really wide, flat floodplain. And that just screams that the river's gonna go like that. And you can, if you look at, I don't have in this presentation, but if, if you look at some of the old historical imagery of like the lower Mills River, for example, you can see old river scars where it used to just go all over the place in the lower end of that watershed. Basically every time the floodplain widens, it, it should have been very um, curvy, basically. So, so Dr. Yeah. Luke, uh, just this last week on Friday, I went up from uh, 64, and we're talking up to the big house and down, and they've started, uh, Conserving Carolina started work. Man, when I first went up there, it was a little bit scary, because I mean, they're, they're cutting some shit down and doing a whole lot of heavy, heavy work. Uh, so that problem's gonna be, that place is gonna be a little weird for a while as they put these in. Uh, there's two different big ponds up in there. Those big ponds are gonna be part of the sloughs. They've acquired a lot of property. It's a massive, it, I think it's much more massive than, than the Mud Creek Project. Uh, but when you go up through there, just 
be prepared for muddy water because if they, once once they open those up, it's going to be muddy for a while. Uh, and uh, kind of check it out. I'm supposed to have some of them come talk sometime soon. Yeah, so they're obviously like one of um, the Wildlife Commission's biggest partners for helping accomplish these types of habitat projects and. And this habitat just really doesn't exist anywhere in Western North Carolina. So uh, there are some little remnants. The Little Tennessee River has a few little places that you can see on the map, but by and large, these things are gone. And so, it, I don't yeah. it, so it's the farming that's caused the problem with the muskie not being able to reproduce? Uh, it, it's a combination of all the different variables, uh, those that have increased sedimentation over time because it's not that may have been farming is part of the picture but you know building roads along the river doesn't help you know any impervious surface anything you're doing to shrink the watershed and make the smaller watershed is the, the harder it's going to flow and the more destruction there is in in the habitat so it's it's destroying the banks it doesn't have the speed is just the shear stress of the river is way higher than it should be and if you can, I mean, we've all been in the upper French Broad. It's not supposed to be like a narrow U. It's supposed to be wider and, and have more, like there should be a riffle and then a pool, you know, and we don't, most of it's just kind of like, like five, six it's feet ditch, deep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so it's a, a giant ditch. And most of us call it the ditch. Yeah. And it's because of the channelization. They turned it straight, okay. as straight as they could for the mountain river. <clears throat> and then uh, also, just to add all that development all the way up into the mountains, anything that washes dirt away. Uh, when you talk to the river keeper, I mean, that's what he looks at a whole lot. And then there's the Muddy Water app that you can download. You can go take the class and uh, they just show you how to see if you see construction sites that when it rains, it's pouring out red muddy water. That's horrible for the river system. So they want you to report all of that stuff so that they can go and correct the situation and make them block and brace all the mud and dirt in there like they're supposed to. But anybody that's lived around this area for a while sees how much development there is here. And it, that's not a help for all the stuff washing in, but all the stuff that he's talking about is like the historical. Yeah, so it's a com combination of factors. Um, but on the bright side, um, as far as our fish species go, even though we have a lot missing, there's been a lot of uh, examples of kind of some uh, recovery stories. So in, uh, in the lower French Broad, there's been at least, uh, in the last 20 years, there's been two crayfish species that have expanded back into North Carolina that we've never had uh, a record of before. There's a mussel, these are all native species a mussel that's now expanded into North Carolina. We never had a record of before. There's uh, four, there's five total fish that are, um, are back in the lower French broad. Four of them we never had a record of. And they're all, they're all native species. So this just shows that conditions are at least improving enough where things are wanting to try and come back to where they used to be. Um, and we have a federally endangered mussel in the French Broad called the Appalachian Elk Toe. Uh, that's also been expanding. Uh, they're in the upper French Broad, um, but it's been really slow. Uh, and I'll go more in depth on why it's slow in a minute. So since things are improving and we see some things coming back, start thinking like, it makes sense that probably the next step is actually trying to uh, reintroduce some of these things. I think for certain species that it's it's time for trying to bring them back. And uh, you know, there's probably a lot of folks who just want to ask the general question: if it's not food for something or like a major food source for something, what other reasons would you want to reintroduce something? So uh, this is like my mission statement: every native species is important for the French Broad ecosystem ecosystem that doesn't mean very much to very many people but it's a mission statement most of those don't mean anything anyways um, so what's it actually mean well for starters um, most fish uh, or most freshwater mussels require a fish host to reproduce they're juveniles early on uh, attached to a fish it helps them uh, spread out around the stream and without that host fish 
muscles can't reproduce at all. So they have to be there. So if you're a muscle species and you need one species uh, to reproduce, one fish species, and that species gone, you're not gonna reproduce. There are some that are generalists and use a lot of different ones, but um, that pink heel splitter that showed up in the lower French broad, for example, their only known host is freshwater drum. Turns out the only place we have pink heel splitters is where the only place where we have freshwater drum that are naturally occurring. So it's real straightforward relationship. Um, uh, our federally endangered Appalachian elk toe mussel um, Turns out they, they can definitely use suckers as their host. So the upper French broad is missing seven species of suckers. There's, that's got to contribute to some degree on how fast they can expand. So if they're expanding but it's really slow, it just tells you there's some, something limiting that expansion. And I think it is in part uh, our lack of sucker diversity. So, uh, you know, another example of like how species can be valuable for rivers, uh, on the, I'm sure a lot of y'all have heard of uh, like the salmon out west, how important they are for, for those streams, you know, in the, their spawning migration, they all go up, they bring all this energy from lower in the system or the ocean, bring it up in, into the headwaters, these smaller streams, and they bring this pulse of energy during that time. Um, a lot of them, most of them die, uh, but that's another source of energy for that uh, uh, otherwise low productivity system. So this uh, pulse of energy is, uh, is critical for everything from algae, insects, fish, bears, everything. Uh, so if you don't have that, everything, the entire uh, ecosystem's uh, negatively impacted. Uh, so you're probably wondering, we don't have salmon, there are at least salmon that are supposed to be here. Um, well, how does this infect, affect North Carolina? Well, suckers in general have something very similar. Uh, most suckers have a spawning run. Uh, here's a picture that y'all can't see that has thousands of uh, buffalo from Sitico Creek in Tennessee. And uh, this, this run alone has, um, it's a big smallmouth buffalo spawning run. And they've counted with the drone, they, they took videos with the drone over the river during spawning season. They're able to actually individually count these fish. Counted over 50,000 fish into a creek in Tennessee during this critical time of the year. If you take away that species, that's a lot of nutrients not going into that stream. So suckers are very much uh, like salmon, but they, they don't, most of them don't die uh, after spawning and they come back year after year. So it's like, they're really important for these places. And um, basically this comes at a really critical time of year, um, a really critical time of year. So you think of like, if you're, you're, you're planting a garden or you have a farm field, basically there's one time of the year that's best for like laying on fertilizer. It's like when everything's starting to grow. And that's exactly how these streams are. These spawning runs are in the spring, right as temperatures are increasing enough for, for uh, reproduction of a lot of insects. That's when algae starts growing. And there's a little bit of energy left in the system and they'll immediately take it all up. And if these suckers have their peak spawning runs, you're giving this pulse of fertilizer into the stream at this really critical time of year. And so everything's gonna benefit. There's gonna be a lot more, more fruits and you know, vegetables in the garden. And so without them, you know, that's a, it's like a very, it, it was a surprisingly straightforward thing that we realized is that when they're coming up, um, I, we had a graduate student that we helped fund do some work through a, like a partnership I'm a part of last year and he, he looked at these sucker runs. He basically measured nitrogen in the water. And so the concept was that you measure how much is coming off of these, these fish, like you hold a fish in a bucket, see how much like excreting, you know, the poop, fish poop, how, how much nitrogen's in that. And, and then you can ex, uh, extrapolate into how much should be going into a stream when there's X amount of fish up there. So what he found um, by taking water samples downstream and where they were is that the nitrogen that they're bringing upstream was staying there. It wasn't 
flowing downstream like you think it was because it's getting cycled by all the, the, the insects, the algae, everything. And so it brings this energy up there and it stays up there. So again, it's not like you're just, you know, pouring something up there and it, it helps a little bit and then it just flows downstream. It actually stays where they go. Sorry if this is a little dense. So when we're thinking about the French broad, this is where all these suckers are. They're all stuck in Madison County. They're all right below Redmond Dam and they want to be upstream. So one of my priorities is to try and figure out how I can get as many of them back upstream because I think everything will benefit from it. From mussels to musky to not that muskies need that much help. I know we started the dam removal group and that was great for a little while, but it's like hard to inject constant activity into that. Yeah. We've got suggestions for me what to do with that and we can. I know that those dams aren't likely to be removed anytime soon. Well, there, there's, uh, you know, there's some funding that came available um, related to fish passage in the last like year or so. And some of that's being, uh, able to be used for some planning purposes and so they, they've approached some of these folks um, to try and look at logistics at least like see if it's feasible or not because that's like often the biggest problem we have is like so you give me whatever 100 million dollars and you say prioritize the dams and you're like well it depends how much sediment's behind it and that you can't do that until you start like a formal study to understand uh, the, the sediment behind there and how much it would take to remove it. <clears throat> just so, so everybody knows, you can't just pull the dams out of the French Broad because they hold probably millions of tons of sand and sediment and all kinds of stuff behind them that you can't just let that flood downstream because it's going to kill everything downstream. So that's the part of the cleanup. Actually, removing the dam probably doesn't cost that much, but getting all the sand. If the, if the sediment removal was free, there'd be a lot less dams. <laughs> <laughs> sure. The uh, down Redmond Dam, for example, I think it was in the mid 80s, late 80s, where the fish ladder supposedly the concrete, now it's gated off up there, which was uh, MSD's folly to, to make everything work. They just wanted to have a ladder where it wasn't functional, but they had a ladder there. Is there anything happening on that now that they can ever get that flowing where they could actually make it up that ramp? Uh, there there actually is right now um some of our folks had a meeting with with duke energy uh, like a month or so ago about they're looking into uh how they can get it going again um my my gut is that it would be way too expensive because it's a weird design and, and yeah. it, i think it was it, it was when it was initially built the intention was for it to allow passage of fish downstream not upstream and you know just that's uh, going to be a complicated task but hopefully they're at least looking into it and that's step one is like if it's not feasible you can go to other options like maybe removal is like the best option if you want to actually have and where that where the ramp is there and the pool underneath it there's no way that they could get the water to go yeah. Where they could get up there it was. It, just, it doesn't. It doesn't take an engineering degree for sure to like tell that that thing is useless uh, at best. Um, so, but there are are folks looking into it, and um, I think if, if people are at least talking about the decision makers are talking about it, that's something's a thousand times more likely than <laughs> than when nobody's talking about it at all. Go ahead and let. Yeah. So, um, anyways. There are things in the watershed that are improving, clearly, and um, it's not all bad news. And uh, so last year we started a uh, sucker reintroduction for uh, with three different species. Um, they're, uh, I'll go over them in a second. Um, they're the three most abundant species found right below Redmond Dam. You know, you can find all three species in the hundreds and that makes it a lot easier for starting um, a reintroduction project when you can find lots of them. We don't have to use a hatchery, we can get wild animals and uh, that helps kind of preserve the genetic diversity of these species and we don't really have to think that much about it and we know that they're reproducing if they're adults. So in theory, you know, if you get enough in there that want to start a spawning run, they'll do it in uh, com uh, coming years. So 
Uh, they are big fish. We haven't been able to move a ton so far, but we're kind of just uh, figuring out the process last year. We moved uh, 79 smallmouth red horse, 50 smallmouth buffalo, and 23 black buffalo. Um, so even though it doesn't seem like a lot, that was about eight full days of, of collecting and moving animals. So you think like we have a live well trailer holds, you know, between three and 500 gallons can't fit a lot of fish that are, you know, 24 inches long. So uh, with, if you put too many in there, they get stressed and they're less likely to do well where you move them. So uh, figuring out the process and that was just two kind of uh, translocation date, uh, like trips. There were three days at a time where we targeted a different species each day. And then we also, uh, in the last couple, couple years, we started uh, reintroductions of uh, uh, one of those smaller fish, maximum seven inches, um, tangerine darter in the upper French broad. And I'll go over some uh, little tricks for identifying these things, show you all pictures here in a second. And uh, as of a month ago, I finally got approval to start uh, reintroducing freshwater drum into the upper French broad. So that's a cool uh, thing that will hopefully get started this year. And since we, we have, we, we there all over our lower French broad, but not in the numbers that we'd really like for moving a bunch in one day. So we're gonna be working with TWRA closer to Douglas Lake where we can get, you know, 50 to 100 in a day and move them all once. And we're gonna pit tag them all because we think that they'll probably utilize these sloughs as well. How hard is it for you to get permission to reintroduce fish? Permission? Well, with the Another reason that I started with these three sucker species is they don't have a state listing. Um, even though they may be, they, there are not very many of them in very many places. So uh, they would maybe, it might be justifiable to at least look into that for them. But that means I, I only have to get like approval from our chief rather than voted on from our commissioners. If something state listed, I have to come up with a formal proposal get it approved by them, and then <coughs> start the process. And I wrote a reintroduction plan for freshwater drum two years ago, and I just had last month to get approved. So it can take a while. So uh, that's why I try to throw a lot of, put a lot of irons in the fire, because you never know um, when it'll actually start up again. One reason Luke is so important to the club is that there are waters that muskies belong in naturally, but they are not in that they could be in. Uh, the pigeon would be one of those. Uh, and after all the pollution damage it had, they've not wanted to stock muskies in there because it's not fully healed yet. He's the kind of person that can help with that and assess that situation. Well, the other place that muskies green, belong in that we don't have in is the green paper plants goes down that might help the clarity of the water there. Right. I mean, That's more clear aside from that, you've also got the little Tennessee, which muskies belong in, which runs through Fontana and all its tributaries, which muskies, in theory, belong in. And, you know, it's for the future, it's just something to think about, and that's, he's pushing for native species, and that's why I fully support everything that he's doing. Where do you actually move the uh, species that belong to Yeah, so these, um, these three sucker species, uh, we, we moved them uh, to the Horseshoe Etowah uh, access spot because we thought habitat was definitely like kind of slower, deeper, which these fish like. And um, if they wanted to hightail it downstream, they, they have some nice, nice sloughs to check, check on the way down. So uh, when our first, our, so we started reintroducing them in June, uh, we did, had a big, uh, mess of uh, the smallmouth buffalo and uh, within two weeks um, the pit tag antenna recorded one using a slew so it was like kind of proof of concept the the pit antenna was down several months this like late summer fall uh, so we haven't gotten like one since but we haven't put very many fish in the river so we're you know it's and, and they hadn't done their winter download I think yet so uh, you know I I'm at least optimistic because they definitely, where I've collected them in other places, uh, they're definitely using that kind of habitat. So I think it's 
it's a real good sign that we've had one use it already because it's not like that uh, pit antenna is like right at the mouth like they just like kind of slipped over like they were going up in there so uh, as far as monitoring goes uh, it may seem like a lot with all these different species we're putting back but if you design your monitoring program like in a like a smart way you can basically just do long-term monitoring at specific sites every year and you're monitoring for all these different species you're reintroducing so that's kind of our plan we're going to start that long-term monitoring up here um, this year and we're also hoping that our uh, uh, district folks uh, help out and uh, making report some data we sent uh, some information on how to ID these when they're doing their musky sampling this this around right now um, well also we're putting pit tags in every single one of these so if any of y'all are not familiar with like the pit tags pit tags are like microchips for like in pets so each pit tag ha is like a unique pit tag that you can identify that individual fish so you can look at how long they live how far they've moved um, uh, survival that kind of thing and when we go out and sample we can catch them it's not just the antenna that's reading them it's also we can scan it on the boat and see if we like when that fish was put in the river and then something that especially for things that uh, like the freshwater drum whenever that starts happening um, I think those would, are going to be bycatch probably a lot more than um, some of these suckers unless you're targeting uh, something similar type of habitat um, angler reports are going to be really important uh, as time goes on and I definitely need y'all's help to at least keep an eye on the river and and if you're seeing some of these things even uh, contacting me when you see big congregations of fish in the spring it's really good to know where those are like where are things spawning what species are those that kind of thing um, so just quickly go through these species I said we're reintroducing and just talk a little bit about how to ID them and maybe why they're important so uh, this first fish uh, is the smallmouth red horse there uh, I, I don't think y'all necessarily have this issue but it's a common public uh, misconception that a lot of suckers are misidentified as carp and they'll think carp are bad so they'll throw a native sucker on the bank or like you know they get demonized for no reason um, so these are not carp the Carp have whiskers, Sim that's as simple as it gets. So if they have whiskers, it's not a carp. So uh, none of these have barbels or whiskers, whatever you like to call them. Um, this smallmouth red horse is really easy to ID. It has a bright red tail. Nothing has a bright red tail in the upper French broad. So if it has a bright red tail, there's a very high probability it's this species. So if you're out there and you've even just seen clear water fish down in a pool and it has a bright red tail that means it's it's one of these um, we have another red horse that gets a like a little pink on its tail this is red bright red it's so it's it's pretty simple and and this fin right here uh, its other nickname or its other common name used to be um, hook fin because it has a hook dorsal fin so it's it's they're real real easy to identify because of those features and there's no similar species in the watershed. Is that the same sickle fin? It is. The, those two can get confused, but luckily sickle fins are on the different? French broad. They are different. Okay. Yeah, sickle fin. It's, sickle fin's only found in western North Carolina and a little bit of Georgia. We'll give them that. But um, these are all over and pretty widespread. More, they're way more widespread. Whereas sickle fin's only found in western North Carolina and northern Georgia. Um, so this next one, smallmouth buffalo, this is that species that uh, I told y'all that they counted over 50,000 of individuals in Sitico Creek. Again, they, are, they uh, do not have barbels. They can be a little more difficult to ID compared to the black buffalo that we're moving. But uh, some of the big uh, characteristics is um, what makes them hard to ID is there's not like something we can count or like there's not like a really a coloration difference. Um, they have a smaller head than black buffalo, so it's just a smaller percentage of their body. 
and then it has a, what is a somewhat visible hump. On some of them, it's more obvious than others. Uh, that, but in general, buffalo, you, they're easy to differentiate from like the other sucker species because they're they're like shaped like a football. They're a lot deeper. They're just big old chunky critters. Um, compared to the black buffalo, they're uh, they don't have a hump, so it's a little more streamlined, which may be hard to tell. But you can see that the head looks a little bit a um, little bit bigger on the body. See see how small the head looks. And then the black buffalo is larger. I know it's hard to see on this screen, but um, there are species that, since they are, they do look so similar to smallmouth buffalo. We didn't, even, we don't even have a record before 2000 of the species because they're just getting lumped in. We, all of our big river sampling was done by TVA in the past, and they, we just had like one record, and it was. But the reality is, there's a lot more up there because that when you look there, I mean that sometimes are the most abundant buffalo. Um, the tangerine darter may look like a lot of y'all's uh, musky lures. Um, they're around seven inches uh, max size. Males get bright orange, that's where they get their name. Uh, this is a, a spawning condition male and they get a, it's hard to tell, but uh, it gets a lot of blue and really reflective coloration on them when they're in peak spawning condition. So they're absolutely gorgeous fish like don't spread this around but I think they're better looking than brook trout but uh, they're they're <laughs> incredible critters and it's really cool to see this is a female behind here with they have no orange on them at all so very they males and females look very different um, we've been uh, uh, some another easy ID character is they get these black dots above this black lateral line and there's really no other darter that gets that. So it's a fairly straightforward. They, they're our biggest darter. They're one of the biggest darters that exist. Um, and we started reintroducing them in the French Broad uh, near Rosman, uh, the Mills River, and then the Swananoa. Um, when did you do that? Uh, we started that in uh, 2021, May 2021. And what was, what's cool about it is every time we've gone to stock more, we see ones from the previous year. So they're sticking around because they're they're a species that they're not they're not like uh, they're not threatened by any means. They're fairly tolerant for uh, darters in general are pretty sensitive, but these are like one of the most tolerant darters. They like kind of, they'll they'll they're happy on riprap, you know, like their habitat requirements are not huge, but um, and they got wiped out of the upper French Broad, so they're not at all in the upper French Broad, but they're about everywhere else. They're in the lower French Broad. They're in the pigeon. They're in um, the Nolichucky, they're, you know, they're tuck, you know, they're everywhere. Um, but they're not in the upper French Broad, and I think that's like... What's a, the upper French Broad specific? Uh, everything above the dams. Where in Rosman did you stop them? Uh, by Lines Mountain Bridge. Because I, I, we go there a lot for some other stuff, and uh, I like going, I like putting things in places I go often so I can look for them. <laughs> I, just, I didn't know if you moved them up, you know, that Yeah. The darter is it is basically a plankton eater. Uh, they they they're like a specialist insect eater. So um, they eat a lot of insects, but they they're actually really friendly. If you ever snorkel with them, they just they just watch you and try and catch them. They'll just move over and then you know watch you again. That's why it's like an easy species for us to move because we can get a couple tries netting them. You know, but. Um, but yeah, they're really important as a, a, a muscle um, fish host. And they're also, I think it's good to like kind of build up anything that's charismatic. If it looks cool, I think we need to show people that this is in your backyard. And they're only, you know, the Western North Carolina, Eastern Tennessee, that's basically the only places that they occur. So it's something we should, you know, care a little bit more about than we have in the past. Um, um, I'm, I'm really, over time, I'm getting worse and worse at describing to people like why something is what it is. And, but I feel like with drum, I can get away with it. Freshwater drum, they look like a drum. So that's how you ID it. If it looks like a drum, it's a drum. Uh, 
but they uh, they you know they look really similar to the you know the red drum and black drum. They have really similar body shape to black drum, and when they get really large, they look as goofy as a big black drum does. Their head is real inflated. Um, they're the the only freshwater species in that family, and um, they're really cool because well they have um, this is a spiny part of their their dorsal fin, and this is soft like you know like a lot of other species. But they uh, they're silver. They primarily when they're when they're when they're small, what they eat is mostly like uh, midge larvae, a uh, small like wormy looking insects. And then when they get a little bit larger, they start eating like aquatic snails. And then uh, eventually get to where when they're really big, they'll start eating like smaller mussels. And since we had all basically all of our mussels wiped out in the last hundred so years. It really makes sense like why you don't have this big river fish that big ones were eating only mussels like we haven't, we haven't had mussels in the big river for a really long time so definitely not enough to sustain a species but um, might be the positive side of some of our non-native clams that have been put in the river uh, cor corbicula the, the golden clam or asian clam um, they're all over the place if you've seen a bunch of shells in the bank uh, uh, that like a midden in the french brothers are 99.9% .9 of the time it's going to be a, a, a bunch of those, those, those clams and these things will eat a lot of those clams. So I think this is a, at least one, the only positive of a non-native clam is like, well, it can actually probably make big drum happy at some point. Do you want to hear real quick why clams and mussels are important? Yeah. So, um, I know I, that's probably a whole other conversation. So, uh, I don't know if you, a lot of y'all know, I guess I should explain this, but uh, what I do for the Wildlife Commission, I'm a, what's called an aquatic wildlife diversity biologist. So I, what traditionally folks have described as non-game, uh, non-game biologist, aquatic biologist. So I, I, I'm basically doing conservation work for non-game fish, mussels, and crayfish is what my job is. And uh, so I end up spending a lot of time uh, playing with mussels and basically why mussels are so important is they're they are one of the most imperiled most uh, they're they're a group of animals that basically are declining everywhere they are they're a highest conservation need of everything and part of it is their comp complex life cycle uh, using fish fish to reproduce but the other side of it is that they literally filter water all they're doing is filtering water. If you have poor water quality, they're not gonna do well. If there's something impacting algal growth or you know, like natural bacteria in the system, it's gonna cause a problem. If you don't if you have planktivores that are missing, so planktivores typically eat larger plankton. And if you don't have planktivores, you have mostly larger plankton, which mussels do not like. So it's like just a connection. If you're missing the fish species that eats these larger plankton, the mussels are gonna uh, be in trouble. So the fact that they're literally filtering out, I mean, they, they eat E. coli. That's like one of the, like anything that's on a micro level, they, they are eating. And uh, they, like any other species, uh, groups of species, they all have different uh, preferences and what they need. And, yeah. Can a zebra mussel live down here that's up in the Great Lakes and all that? Hopefully not. Uh, the, the, the assumption is no, but we don't want to find out because they, they ruin everything. Um, they, uh, we think that our calcium is too low, but I am kind of, I'm skeptical because um, there are forms of calcium that are not in the water column that mussels can use. And so it's not really clear whether they would do well or not. We just don't want to find out. Um, we had a scare a couple of years ago, but we have um, with some pet stores that had some. But uh, so far, we're in the clear. Um, yeah. So these freshwater drum, you know, they eat mussels uh, when they're bigger, and there are mussel species that have evolved to to deal with that. So this pink heel splitter, I don't know if y'all can tell, but it has a large wing on it. And it, the idea is that that wing, which is more present when they're younger, is harder for a, a fish to try and eat it because it's, it's like a lot longer and harder to put in their mouth. So they have like an evolutionary 
like adaptation for dealing with being a primary food source of a fish. So it's, it's just like a really cool thing that nerds like me like to think about. Um, yeah, so we're gonna start reintroductions uh, hopefully, hopefully in the next month um, and maybe uh, again in, in the fall. So we'll, we'll see. For Is that sure. hatchery species or are you block collecting uh, These will be, majority of what I try to do is, is um, not using hatchery. And there, there are plenty, there's plenty of work to go around that doesn't require hatchery space. And uh, hatchery space, the state is a, a, you know, a hard thing to come by. Like we're, we're we have no space, any of the hatcheries basically. And I definitely don't, something that something like this i don't want to take up hatchery space especially when we have a good population we can pull from so that's always the first thing i'm always going to try and do something we can easily pull from in a day because it may take you know you know thirty thousand dollars and a bunch of time of, of folks to to try and grow 50 adult or 50 juveniles of one of these species let alone you know adults and we can move the adult right away so it's just i think it'll they'll come back quicker using the hatchery system for recovery for conservation is always like kind of a last uh ditch effort like you don't want to have to use the hatchery it's normally because you don't have enough animals to to move on their own so we try to um, get these wild translocations when we can um a lot of that has to do with preserving the genetic integrity too. If you take two animals, spawn them in the hatchery, you only have genetics from those two animals. Whereas if I move 50, 50 fish, they all 50 are different. So uh, it makes it a lot easier to keep them in uh, good shape. Uh, yeah, so future directions, we're gonna continue I have a lot of my career left, so I'm going to continue the sucker project until it works or I retire, which I hope it's just until it works. Um, we're going to continue reintroduction to some other species. We were exploring some other ideas for potential species in the upper French broad, at least ones that we think would be beneficial to the, you know, the, the French broad ecosystem as a whole. Um, we're going to be monitoring or surveying annually. Uh, I live in Asheville, so it makes me want to focus a lot more on the French broad, but I think there's a lot more potential there than there are a lot of other places. Upper French broad it, it may have a sad history, but I think it's got uh, a bright future when you think about all the things that um, the river's gone through over the years. And hopefully we'll continue to do these uh, slough oxbow restorations uh, we definitely have uh, a few more on the books I and mean, there's a bunch of folks the private landowners that want to have it on their properties too so hopefully that will keep on going and we can keep on building this kind of habitat uh, it's not only beneficial to muskie but uh, a bunch of other things um, this is more of a slide trying to address some of the conversations i saw on the muskie uh, facebook page uh, just kind of talking about some of the species that are native or not native. Um, this may just be an easier list for y'all to like have, like on, like to look at at home. But ultimately, we have there's a lot of things we have a pretty good idea of whether they're native or not. Um, there are some things that there are some discrepancies. Um, it's at least not easy to tell whether they're native or not because um, we've been reintroducing or we've been stocking non-native species for a long time so it's really some of these species it's been so long we've been stocking them that we don't actually know if they were there before um, but these were we're very confident about typically if it's if it's something native it's either why well, wouldn't it be native uh, based on where they are uh, nearby or we have like a very, very early record of it. Yeah. So is there an objective to uh, replenish all the native species or just pick certain uh, animals to come back? Yeah, so um, 
I'm definitely, uh, I, I, I target very specific ones based on likelihood of success. Do they have a source population? And what's their value uh, added? And so the suckers, as I talked to, you know, about like kind of the spawning migration, I think they're very high up on like value added. There's a lot of things that eat baby suckers too. So I think there's a lot of things that would benefit from that. What about crab? I actually don't see very many. I assume they're around, uh, but they're on there. That's yeah. to the Biltmore State. Those boys at the sloughs sitting there keeping two and three man lemons. So like one time I was, that's true. One time I was putting in at, at a boat landing on Prince of Rock, and there was probably 50 or somewhere between 50 and 100 crappy that had been you know, splayed mm. and just the, the skulls and the, mm. the body was laying there. And I'm just curious for the paper. <laughs> I, did they come from the first row? A lot of them come from that crate right there. You think so? Yeah. And from the bass ponds down on the Biltmore State, when they flood down there, they, they've been down in there you too. You can find real big slack water there in there. Yeah, and so that that is like more to explain. That's why I don't see them very often because the slack water just uh, isn't. Not very, much of it. It's a limiting habitat uh, in mountain streams and mountain rivers. Um, so one of my, outside of like continuing with the, the sucker uh, reintroductions and the freshwater drum, uh, I'm really hoping long term uh, to do paddlefish. That's one I've been having to negotiate a lot with. Uh, and uh, it's it's complicated because it's it's very charismatic, and um, even though it be, something being charismatic is positive, it also brings a lot of attention and scrutiny at the same time. So we're working through that. But what I really want to do is establish something that's we don't have a, a fish species that is meant to be a planktivore in a big river. We don't have a single. Our biggest planktivore is it's like this long. So uh, we don't even have gizzard chat. Gizzard chat used to be up there too. So um, trying to find something that we, uh, a species that's native and will utilize what's available in the water column and help transfer that energy and change the plankton dynamics that will, may benefit other species is, is my next step I'm trying to do. But um, just going to answer your question of, yeah, it's like very uh, targeted on what like groups I'm trying to do. And, and some of the other ones are like conservation status. You know, we don't have them very many places and we need to get them as many places as we can so you don't have one stream that can just be wiped out immediately. Um, do you all have any other questions about this? Because I, I have some pictures of some of the other species after this. Yeah. yeah. What efforts is being put towards the gizzard shed being reintroduced to the upper creek problem? I'm the only person I know of that has even like had that come out of their mouth. So, uh, uh, so what my plan is, is that's one, there's a lot of reasons I'm here today, not just as a musky fisherman, a lifetime musky fisherman. Yeah, so there's a lot of habitat that this, like Jim said on the end that I heard, got a lot of streams in North Carolina. That a lot of lakes in North Carolina, but there ought to be musky in by now. They've been here 50 years, and uh, we're not there. Uh, most of the gizzard chad, man needs a truckload of gizzard chad, and man get one of them for a car. Yes, and I take a good net and, and a loaf of bread, and I can bring you back a truckload of gizzard chad full enough to bring for a river. I mean, yeah, so they're, they are in the Madison County portion of the French Broad. We definitely uh, see them there, and we've, we're uh, kind of just working out, trying to figure out where to get gizzard chat from. Because what was historically stocked in our lakes, Lake James, you know, Fontana, the, the, those are not like gizzard chat from here. So if you're really trying to get a species to be self-sustaining and do well in a mountain environment, you want genetics that are as close as you can uh, get to the mountain environment. Because 
these other, you know, most of, you know, are like walleye, for example. Walleye were initially started being stocked from animals from New York State. And New York State's very different than, than North Carolina. So you can imagine that they're adapted to a way different, you know, type of environment. May, there may be certain situations where they don't do as well because they are not adapted to be here. How many, how many species, how many species of gizzard chad are there? There's only, gizzard chad's its own species. Uh, there's a, another species called a threadfin shad that was, uh, looks very similar and was stocked in a lot of reservoirs. Those are not native anywhere close to here. Um, and then there's been a lot of illegal introductions of things like blueback herring and uh, other similar species to the alewife, um, which have had you know pretty negative impacts on some of our lakes, uh, especially for things like walleye. Uh, but just to put this out there: no way, shape, or form are we suggesting that anybody take any species of fish and try to move it up river. Okay? And, and I do. That's I, his job. I do do this for it's like what all I've ever done in my adult life so I put a lot of effort into it so it's not I'm not just haphazardly doing this so um, I'm trying to do what's in the best interest of the river so just gotta gotta trust me <laughs> for. What, what he was just saying about something we talked about a couple weeks ago when me and him met up just had a out of here conversation was even our muskies are not muskies from this area None of them are. Where did they come from? Kentucky or something? Ohio. Initially Ohio, in the right. 70s. And they could have probably taken a, a muskies from another place, more farther down south, more in our chain that would have been our native muskies and put them in our river. Is there such a thing as a native muskie left in Western North Carolina? Not in, not in French, not in upper French, bro. There would be probably the little Tennessee or Nantahala. Nothing can be proved. Yeah. Okay, we haven't found a natural bred fish in, as long as I can remember. Now he has all of them, and I have all these historical documents that he shared with me. He's put a lot of time into the study of this stuff, and I mean more than anybody I've ever heard what of besides one, this guy right here. The one that Kyle Fonrath called in the, Montana. What's that? The one that Kyle Fonrath called in Montana. At well, the, Fontana at one time was stopped. Well, is, 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 that, is that a It, it was last stocked in the late 70s. It was, it was stopped. 79. And from the Hunting and Fishing by Gasquay's book, uh, it was in 1947, page seven, 217, it addresses the Little Tennessee and Nantahala where they actually, when they dam, dammed it up, as far as the natural... Uh, have you seen that book by chance? Would you like to read it? What's it called? Uh, Hunting and Fishing in the Great Smokies by Paul I, Gasquay. I, I bought that uh, in the last year or so. So there's potential for natural muskies in that yeah. system? Yeah. The other thing I was going to tell you real quick, uh, before David was our biologist, we had Mickey Clemens. In the three club, three or four club members we took uh, to see if we were getting natural reproduction. We put it Dingle Creek, Mud Creek, and that creek that went to the left as you put in Pisgah Forest where that big railroad tie comes out, there's a creek in there. We took car batteries in there with crappy lights and we would go for three or four days mm -hmm. to see, and we never got anything except the little Dace Menace. Yeah. And then the next year, Mickey went out west and he got like a Pentagon type of a, a plexiglass with a green siloom light that went down in there. Mm -hmm. And it was bad, uh, a 12 hour thing. And the only thing we ever got there was the little Dace Menace. We never, where there was potential tributaries and stuff like that, uh, two or three years. That's in the, the Bible down there. Mm -hmm. He's got it with him or at the house. Yeah, so uh, the, on the, the positive side, there has been a shift in the last like 10 years to start paying more attention to the, the, those genetic components because historically, when we've stocked, it's all just been about like, put as many as you can out there for folks to fish for. And that's what, that was what, you know, the people wanted. And now we're realizing more and more how important these components of like the genetics are for uh, making a sustainable population. And um, 
And you think about it, if you have a clone of something, if something kills the clone, it's going to kill all the fish. You know, if you have a, a you know, like I'm a Sasquatch, somebody else is, is like Tim's way shorter than me. We look like two different animals. And there's some things that are going to impact me differently than they impact Tim. And it's the same with these fish. We may not be able to tell the difference, but they are adapted for different things. And you, different, certain types of disturbances will impact them better or worse than the other. So um, that's kind of the idea behind like maximizing that genetic variation or like having it closer to where they adapted is so you, they're used to mountain, you know, their genes are used to mountain life. So uh, hopefully going forward, we can, um, you know, address some of those problems, but it's, it's, it's tricky. It's, it's a tricky problem because we have a lot of habitats that lakes, for example, we don't, we never had lakes. So of course the fish are not adapted to live in a, in a lake. So um, walleye are like a tricky one because there are lake strain walleye and there are river running walleye. What we historically have are river running walleye. And that's why we have records of them in the upper French Broad uh, near Horseshoe. And um, so if you're using lake running walleye genetics to try and restore the upper French Broad, you're gonna fail because there, that habitat does not exist. So there's complications is what I'm getting at. But um, on the bright side, there's uh, some of the species thinking about or have um, see off in the distance, maybe getting in into the watershed. Um, I think sauger or walleye would be really cool in the upper French Broad. Uh, probably both of those species re require hatchery space and like a lot of thoughtful genetic work ahead of time because we there are still river running walleye. So I think we could those may be like the native varieties that we could work with, but there's a lot of stress on the hatchery right now. So it's something. I'm thinking about, but wait until the right opportunity to do that. Um, paddlefish, obviously something I'm working on. Um, there's a lot of complications with it, but they are, uh, they're going to be like kind of a long haul hatchery project because you don't get very many. And uh, they are not quite as bad as lake sturgeon, but they, you know, take, you know, 10 years to start reproducing. So you need to stock for 20 years before you figure out if it's going to be successful or not. And that, that's a lot of commitment. Um, here's a cool little mad tom. It's called a mountain mad tom. They're only about this big, but they're mad toms in general are like a group of their species. There are catfish, but they're like a group of catfish species that are more sense. They're really sensitive to pollution and that kind of thing. So they're not very widespread, but they're canaries in a cave. Yeah, they, they really are. Uh, and uh, so they're not very many places. Mountain mad toms are actually in pretty good number in hot springs now. So we think maybe we'll be, we could uh, uh, translocate them at some point. They can survive all the yeah. pollution from Asheville. Yeah. Well, I've talked to a lot of folks down there where they say, you know, when they're growing up, you know, every time there's a decent rain, there's oil barrels going down the road and you see all sorts of crazy stuff floating down the river. And now it just like gets muddy. So I, I, I would call that progress. Hey, I grew up <laughs> on the Fresh Broad River and I'm not as old as some of these guys, but I've seen a lot of change. Yeah. Um, so uh, this fish on the left, bottom left is uh, one I'm, what I think is for my work area is uh, uh, the most rare fish we have in Western North Carolina. It's called a blotch side log perch. It's a type of darter. They, uh, they're Say that again. blotch side log perch. So um, log perch, there's, there's several different species of log perch, but these are, um, this is a species that's only found in like the upper Tennessee River watershed. Uh, they're probably more widespread. Uh, they're probably all over like the Tennessee River Basin in North Carolina at one point, but now they're only found in one stream in North Carolina. And that's the South Toe River, which is South Toe's, what I think is like the nicest river in Western North Carolina, uh, you know, fish, fish diversity wise. And they have a lot of positive things going on. You know, it's like 99% forest cover in the watershed. So 
it should be <laughs> pretty nice. <laughs> um, so they used to be in the Swannanoa. We have a record of uh, them in the Swannanoa and French Broad. Uh, so, but they're really, they're site feeders, so turbidity is bad. So unless a uh, stream uh, gets clear quick, like the South Toad, they don't do well. Um, they're really cool because they, uh, when they, this is like a, like a young adult, when they are like a big adult, their nose gets swollen because all they do is flip rocks and find insects, very specific insects. So you can snorkel, watch them, and they're just flicking rocks, eating it. And then they're looking at you. They know, they know you're there. And they're, it's like they're showing off. And if you try and grab them, you'll never see it again. So they're, they're like the smarter, older, wiser um, brother to tangerine darters. Um, this middle one here, uh, it's a federally threatened uh, species called uh, spotfin chub. And they, uh, they used to have a common name called the turquoise shiner because the males, it's hard to tell here, but the males get bright turquoise, like, like blind you turquoise. And uh, they used to be in the Swannanoa as well. Um, now they're on, only in the Lil T and um, Chiola. And we're gonna start reintroducing them this year as well. Uh, we had some, it's been a long process, but we're, we finally came to this agreement where we can, uh, we have a way to reintroduce better listed species without adding regulatory, perceived regulatory burden to um, landowners. So, um, I say perceived because I don't. I don't think there was regular. There would be a regulatory burden, but at least we have a legal way to, like, a document. People can sign and say you are not going to be held liable if something happens to the species in the river, basically. And so, um, that being said, we're going to start trying to reintroduce them in the French Broad. Hopefully this year, if we can get our ducks in a row, um, and. That'll be really cool. And we'll know they don't get very old, they maximum five years and they reproduce when they're like two years old. So you, you'll be able to see if it's a successful reintroduction in like two years, because they would have, um, they'd be reproducing um, already. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and it's a cool little thing. They don't get very big, but they are, um, they're, the reason they got wiped out is because they're crevice spawners. So a crevice spawner is a, a type of fish that like in bedrock where you have a crack or you have big boulders they the females lay the eggs in that crack and then the male will fertilize them and when you have sedimentation everywhere it fills up those cracks and so they can't reproduce and that's you know that's that's why they got wiped out and we think the, the worst sedimentation we had was were in the clear cutting days those days are long gone and there's a lot of places that are probably cleaned up enough where they can do well. It's not like the Little Tennessee River's pristine by any means, but they, there's been enough pockets of, of uh, good bedrock that they can reproduce and stick around. And so we're hoping, hoping uh, we can start reintroducing them in uh, several places this year. Four, we have four target uh, waterways, um, French Broad, South Toe, Tuckasegee, and um, the wild card is uh, the Swannanoa, and uh, there may be a lot of negative opinions about Swannanoa, but I live on it, and basically, you know, if we have a bad rain, river's clear in a couple days, which is like pretty reasonable as far as like turbidity goes. So hoping that that is the more impacted of those three streams, depending on how you look at it. And uh, so with each of these sites, we're trying to learn <coughs> <coughs> we don't want all the sites to be the same, so if the reintroduction doesn't work, we can know what variable is different between the sites. So if it doesn't work at one, we can say, if in the Swan and just say there's just too much sediment moving through the system and there's too much like, you know, too many people living on the river. <coughs> and if it's the tuck, you can say maybe it's related, if it doesn't work in the tuck, maybe it has to do with the, the, the peaking from the dams or um, temperature fluctuations throughout the day and there's a lot of development going on in the watershed so there's different you know questions we can get answered during these prod uh, these reintroductions too but that is basically that's all so I don't ramble about spot and shoves anymore um, 
I can answer any other questions uh, about some of the work we're doing. And yeah. Tomorrow I will send out the what is it the North American Native. Oh yeah. Well, what is that? North American Native Fishes Association. Anybody that's interested and wants to follow this kind of a lot of the micro fish, just, it's not all just micro fish, it's all kinds of species. I find the stuff interesting myself and I've been kind of checking on it. Is that what Ryan does up yes. in yes. North Toe? Anybody and who's met Ryan, Ryan come to a meeting a while back. Uh, he's been involved on, on the Facebook page. He's, he, he's a really interesting dude. Uh, and he is into, he is into this micro fishing or and multi-species fishing and, and I mean he's just fired up about it so uh, I may have him come talk one day just because it's, it's pretty interesting huh he's a fully functioning autistic adult and smart his, thing is micro fishing and I tell you what I asked him today because like well I'm out with my kid playing in the river this micro fishing is something she can do and learn from and probably catch a lot more fish than we ever catch when she's musky fishing on my boat. Yeah. Yeah. He, he is very about catching fish, you know. Yeah, so, they might not be but that long, but so you know, on, yeah, like, talking about all the micro on that on that yeah. note, like so micro fishing is like kind of related to like life list fishing or whatever where <laughs> you're going out and just trying to get as many species as you can. And it's like I think it satisfies that part of the brain that yeah. that birders have you know, where you just want to see different things. And to like microfish, you get to think about habitat on a different level than you ever have, because your, your habitat is right here. Right. And um, it's really what, what I like the most about the microfishing component is, is that like when we were all little and we were fishing, what you cared about was catching something. What, what made you hate fishing is when you did not catch something. And, and that is like, like something, something you can very easily do so in, in any little stream in your backyard <laughs> get your a kid to catch his little fish and that's how you get them to like care about you know these things down the road and then transitioning a little bit to like the sucker thing is like all of our ancestors were fishing for suckers and eating suckers and there was a a, a incorrect thought about what they how they competed with game fish historically and so they were demonized for almost a century and the peak was in the 70s mm -hmm. and and now that we're getting further away from that folks are starting to understand more like oh they are valuable these these big spawning runs are valuable to our our bass or our trout or whatever species we care about like because they are bring improving everything they're not just eating all the eggs or eating up all the resource like these rivers are dynamic and can hold a lot we just got to like give them all the pieces to to make it work. What species is the knotty head or horny head? Uh, most commonly, uh, common species that people call a knotty head or a horny head is called a river chub. River chub. And there's a few other chub species that are really similar. Um, there's uh, creek chubs, they get, they get little horns on them too. Uh, stone rollers get a body full of, of the tubercles, the horns. And then when you go drainage over, you go into the Atlantic Slope, you get bluehead chubs. They are like the, the the Atlantic Slope version of a river chub. They're popular down at Redmond Dam, I can tell you that. Yeah, well, yeah. There's a lot more species of these things than you ever thought possible. Oh, yeah. And Ryan what showed that. What you're saying is that they're drainage specific. I mean, it's, it's, it's wild. I mean, I've, I've really started watching this since Ryan come on the scene. And, and it's, it's interesting shit. Yeah, so the new river has its own river chub called a big mouth chub um, and and what I always describe to folks with about these chubs. these chubs is they they are like one of the most important fish we have in the stream even though they're common and people get pissed because they are the males are aggressive especially certain times of the year and you catch a lot when you're not going for them um, folks did used to eat those too by the way but um, they they build mounds that they, uh, the, they spawn on. So they're these chub mounds. They look like a bunch of similar sized pebbles built up in a pyramid. If you ever see them in a stream, yeah. like when they're like that small, that's not like a person dumping something. It's like a fish building that. And basically the female lays her eggs in there and the male protects the nest, keeps the nest built up. And 
it's important for them to have that for their reproduction, but there's like five or six other minnow species that also use those, those mounds. So if you lose this common annoying species, you lose five or six other forage species. So all of a sudden, you know, what, all it takes is one species and you can have everything come crashing down. Um, so just keep that in mind if you ever throw those things on the bank. If they are, yeah. if it's a hot male, it probably had a, has a mound that something's trying to spawn on. Now we always caught them during trout season and it's what's kind of sick about this whole thing is that people would teach me to throw it on the bank or bounce it off a rock. We didn't know no better. But that's a native species, but we're sitting there trying to catch stock trout, which none of them is native to this area at all. <laughs> okay, so. Doe bellies. These guys are doing great work, and I think that the native species deserve a lot of attention. And a lot of these fish species that he's talking about can be caught on the hook and line, and even a lot of them can be used for food. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot more that can be talked about that instead of what is the number one cash crop fish in North Carolina uh, aside from saltwater and that's non-native trout so you know a little bit different has anybody else got anything else for Dr. Luke good job to the Chris Kane in the back uh I think and unless uh, we we figure out a, a better place, we'll probably continue to do uh, horseshoe. Main, mainly, uh, I like the idea for any of these bigger river species, if we're concerned that they would just hightail it downstream and just try and get to like Madison County again, uh, want it to be upstream with some of this bigger river habitat that we're creating in the sloughs. And um, that, so we'll just, I think that's that was like the closest access to to Mud Creek. That's easy for us to. Um, well, the the goal for for any species I'm working with is is that we they come back and with enough force that they can handle that kind of thing and and i don't i don't want any species i have to be like listed because we have options for we have i mean if i mean most of our we have a lot of forested land in western north carolina and if, if which is way more than like most other places especially eastern north carolina and you're like if this isn't a like good enough we're, we're, we're in trouble, you know, so we got to try and work with what we got. And I, I think that's definitely a goal for sure is that it is kind of ridiculous how widespread they are and, and how they would be happy in lakes that we don't, I mean, an easy approach would probably be putting them in some of our, our lakes where they were native um, and expand their, their range. But I think that that'll eventually happen if, if they do well. Yeah. If conserving Carolina gets to put sloughs in at all, what are the chances of putting, reintroducing some of the fish to the river? I, I'd be I'd be happy to move them up as far as we have sloughs. That way they would have they could either go down the French Broad up this fork right north. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's um, this is, this isn't one of these species, but or one of these bigger species, but those spotfin chubs. Um, where I'm trying to put them in the French Broad is in Rosman because of they they rely heavily on they're a, they're an interesting species where they they need they can't water can't be too cold so in the winters if they don't have access to like basically groundwater temperatures uh, which is warmer than a lot of water if they don't have good access to those they they do not survive or have low survival so we need good quality tributaries that are groundwater fed for them to do well. And that's kind of the same concept you're talking about. They need this bedrock and bigger river during most of the year. And then during the winter, they need, uh, they'll need they need go up in the forks. And I think that's why Rosman's a sweet spot for that. And I think that'll be true of a lot of other things. Uh, I'm hoping, the, I, I, I think if we have some success, we'll probably eventually put some of these suckers higher up. Cause I, I, I definitely, 
water's once you get the forks come together, it's, it's not a small, small river. No, it's not. Well, most forks not. It's a lot bigger than it used to be. Yeah. All right, has anybody got any questions on the club trip, October 12th through the 15th?